Hello everyone, great to have your company on the jump. What a time to be alive if you are a Hoops fan. We've got the NBA playoffs just around the corner and the business end of the NBL season as well. Nat Edwards, Andrew Gaze and Leonard Copeland with you. Welcome, gents. Thank you very much. A uh, lot to talk about. Mm. Yeah, can't wait to chat to Trevor Gleeson a little bit yes. later on in the program. Who's over there. Trevor. We do, we'll but be we'll before be we need to do this, how disappointing would it be if you're Scotty Scheffler and you've just won the US Masters, you've only had the green jacket <laughs> for three or four days and already Copes has stolen from you. I mean, you've got... I love, my you, be, I love my jacket. You've got to be disappointed. You've been working on that uh, gag for a while. I like it delivered funny. brilliantly. Let's that get straight funny. into the jump starters before a fight breaks out here on set on the jump. Of course, the jump starters presented by DoorDash, your delivery MVP, the official <laughs> delivery partner of the NBL and Copes. I'm sorry to say, but we're going to have to talk about the Lakers again. We the thought the we were... Flakers. Oh, yeah. Are we the, bringing the Flakers up again? We Flakers. are. We have to because they sacked their coach during the week, Frank yeah. Vogel, yeah. Gonski. But the way that they handled it, no, no, I mean, right. it was fairly disrespectful. It's not right, Daisy. You know those guys. we got four or five veteran guys on this team, mm -hmm. and he didn't even pick the team. LeBron picked this team. Get rid of LeBron, get him out of here, start oh, over. No, Come on, man. Not I'm, sitting, I'm over it. I'm over the Lakers. They're not doing that. But I tell you what is disappointing is that when you hear that uh, even before the last game, they were talking about, well, it's already been announced that he's going to yeah. go. And he, he wasn't even he didn't aware. Know. Now, I think everyone... He, he knew it, though. He, he would have assumed, but you would think there'd be some official c communication before that happened. Handle it poorly for a guy that delivered a championship. Two, two years ago. Two yeah. seasons ago, they're, they're, they're lifting the trophy up and uh, there's, everyone's in love with e each other. And just, you know, Russell Westbrook in particular, who, let's be honest, hasn't had a great year. And he was... Very disappointing when you're a star like this talking about, well, he's never had a, a problem with coaches in the yeah. past and certainly alluding to the fact that uh, Frank Vogel may have been the cause of some of his uh, shortcomings this season. That's poor. Yeah, it's extremely poor. Do you think Frank, you know, coaches again? Well, if you've won an NBA title, people are going to come knocking. Of course, of course. And again, it wasn't his fault. He's a good coach, man. He's a good person as well. The problem is when you got these ego-driven players mm. who think they know everything, then it didn't work, LeBron. It didn't. And I keep going back to LeBron because he's the man. He picked the team. These guys are too old, and it didn't work. The fit wasn't good, and if you want to, you don't make the playoffs. You're 16 games mm. or 18 games under 500 mm. with talent like that. No nah, man. Clearly, whenever you've failed like they have. Everyone's got to be held accountable and everyone's got to take their yeah. chunk of responsibility. But if you're talking about who uh, ultimately is going to take a, a larger portion of that, then it's those main guys. That, that, they handle, like Cope says, it's LeBron with yep. what he's done with his general manager hat on and putting that team together. It, it's also Russell with his poor, poor form. And, and, and Anthony Davis, everyone said, well, he's injured. But... It, even when he was healthy, it wasn't the Anthony Davis we'd seen in the past. So, of course, the attention for the Lakers turns to finding their next head coach. Nick Nurse coaches yeah. the Raptors at the moment. He's represented by Clutch Sports, who also represents mm. LeBron mm. and AD. Do you think there might be some talk there? His name's come up. Well, I think that there'd be a lot of candidates. But you know what? It is going to be a tough, tough job. If they can't trade Russell Westbrook and you're a coach and you're seeing what's happened to Frank Vogel, who Why won you want to a take championship, your job? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, clearly there'd be some, uh, <laughs> some loot <laughs> that would make it somewhat enticing. But, I wouldn't but want that job. If you're talking about your long-term future and... and the thing is, we might have interviewed the next coach of uh, the, the Lakers in Phil Handy. Yeah, he's yeah. a name that, that, when you look at a lot of the projections that are out there, he's in the sort of the top five candidates that there. Another one that, that hasn't been mentioned, but we actually mentioned last week, is Brett Brown. So there'd be, just with the mystique of the Lakers and the profile, obviously there's going to be a lot of people interested. But those top guys, those really top guys like Nick Nurse, they might be wanting to be Lakers coach. I'm not sure right now is the time that you want Why to Why would actually... you want to leave Toronto to go to L.A. Mm. with these 
mega ego driven guys mm. and try to coach them. I well, do it. we should ask Trevor Gleason when he joins us mm. on the show very shortly. Enough about the Lakers. I want to talk about my Brooklyn Nets oh. because they're into the first round of the playoffs. They'll take on the Boston Celtics, of course, after overcoming the Cavs in the play-in. And what a performance from Kyrie. 20 points in that first half. He was hitting them from everywhere and KD also instrumental. Can they take them through? Boston. Well, uh, well, uh, of course they can. I think if these two guys are megastars, that's... So are you the... picking the Nets over Boston? Are you saying that? I, I, I am said, not... Of course, you just said, of course Ooh. they can. Well, they can, but whether they will obviously remains to be seen. But when you see Kyrie in the type of form that he is in and KD, what he's capable of doing, Kyrie in this game was a perfect 12 of 12. Yeah. Now, he ended up 12 of 15. The problem is he's got to go back to Boston where they hate him and they boo him and he doesn't yeah. play well. So yeah. I don't think they're going to get past Boston. I really don't. Well, Boston, when you look at the, the last quarter of the season, or in fact, the last half of the season, they were really the form team. So yeah. it's, it's going to be tough. But I'm absolutely positive that the Boston Celtics, when you looked at those lower-ranked teams, they would not have been picking the Nets if, this was, if they no, had the choice. You yeah. would not. All right. That was the jump starters. Thanks, of course, to DoorDash, your delivery MVP. Still on the Nets, though, the latest on Ben Simmons is that he could be ready to play in game four to six. So, I mean, we've just been following this and whether it happens or not, I don't know. But surely you just put him on ice and get him ready for next season. Well, to me, I, I think the Nets have a real moral decision to make as well. Because uh, if they had, I would almost see, see it as being negligent if they were to play him. When you look back at his history and what he's been through and the spotlight shines brightest in the playoffs and what we saw with Ben last season yeah. with Philadelphia where he came up short and the scrutiny that he was under was the catalyst for mental yeah. health issues. Yeah. You can't take mental health issues uh, lightly and to put him into a situation like this where that's going to be hacker Ben is he going to be able to make some plays on the offensive end? They're going to put him under all sorts of pressure. I'm sure, And Joey. for the mental health, if the mental health consequences yeah. for that, to me, they need to think hard about his welfare as yeah. well as the team's welfare. But I'm welfare. sure they would have had a meeting with him and said, Ben, are you ready to go? It's been a year since he's played, Joy. He's ready to go. you got to put him on the court if he wants he to He had an to epidural for his back a couple <laughs> of weeks <laughs> ago. You like, would know more about that. I, I would, but, but this is the thing. Like, he shouldn't be playing. And, and I agree mm. with you on the mental side of things. I think just put him away mm. and get him ready for the next season. Well, give him, give him 82 games of a regular season to go through the trials and tribulations to make sure you are right and ready. Now, of course, internally they'll do their assessments they'll talk to Ben all those things yep. but from the outside looking in to me it's a high risk activity for his own mental health if Ben says I'm ready to go coach put me in there what do you do as a coach well that will make it tough yeah, that's of course hard. because you know if Ben at his best if you're going to win a title and if the Nets are going to win a title they need Ben at his best, his defensive best, the way in which he can distribute the ball. He's a, he's a match-up problem for our other team. So all those things, from a playing perspective, yes. If you're the owner and you're the coach and you're wanting your best team, absolutely. But if you... You, you just got to be cautious Drew, about putting... He's around some. all these positive guys now. Patty Mills, he's got KD, he's got Kyrie. They're all positive. They're saying, let's go, Ben. We need you for the championship. Mm. He's ready to go. Put him in there. We will see what happens with Ben Simmons. Of course, stay tuned to the jump and ESPN.com.au. Still on the NBA playoffs, the 76ers face the Toronto Raptors in the first round. Our own Aussie, Matisse Thibel, though, will be missing for games three and four on the road. He's not fully vaccinated, so he can't actually enter the country in Canada. It's a pretty big blow to their defense. That's poor. That's, if you're going to get one shot, why not get the, the rest? Right? You're hurting your team now. Mm. No one no one knew this. It, all, it comes out all of a mm. sudden. And now they got to go to Toronto and play without him. One of the best defenses, defensive players in the league. Mm. It's going to hurt them. No, it is. It is. And when you think of guys like Scotty, Scotty Barnes or Van Fleet, he's so flexible on the defensive end. That is a huge, huge loss. Well, speaking of the playoffs and the Toronto Raptors, it's time now to welcome in our special guest for today. He is a man who coached the Perth Wildcats in the NBL to five championships. He's now an assistant coach at the Raptors. Trevor Gleeson, welcome to The Jump. Thanks, Nat. Great to be here. 
great to have you on. Hey, a really exciting time for the Raptors, obviously, going into the playoffs. Do you think you can make some noise? Yeah, it's... Uh, look, we're pretty talented when we have them all back on the floor playing and we're just getting in a rhythm with each other and starting to play. It's really exciting. We... We know we can do some damage and um, hopefully we can do that in the first round. Hey, Trev, uh, congratulations on the season you guys have had. Uh, you know, looking at your roster, little surprise. You, you look at it and you, uh, watch you guys play because you're there. Is, is internally, is there, have you exceeded expectations? Yeah, I think the, the uh, so-called experts had <laughs> us for 37 <laughs> wins and, and missing the playoffs and missing the play-in and, you know, we've had a lot of adversity this year with most of the players uh, being stuck with COVID, with injuries and uh, a lot of mixed lineups. But, you know, we also got some really good players in Freddie Van Vliet, the All-Star, and Scotty Barnes. And Pascal has been playing at another level this last three weeks. And, and then we got OG coming back uh, this week. So it's uh, exciting when we have everyone on the floor. Trev, you being one of the best NBL coaches around, what have you learned in the NBA? Is there something new? I think it's, it's player management. You, you're, playing, you, you're coaching the most confident players in the world. So <laughs> they're going to question everything. Yeah. They're going to ask why. And you've got to have a plan to explain that to them. And what you're trying to get the team to do more so than their individual scores. And that's, you know, Coach Nurse does a great job with, uh, with the communication and the guys play their hearts out for him and it's a great organisation to be under. Hey, Trev, you look at the way you coached your teams, very structured, the, the flex offences and you're able to uh, really get specific with, their, with those roles. When I watch you guys playing, I'm thinking, what's going through Trev's head here? Because <laughs> this is not the way you used to coach. How, no. uh, how does that, is it comfortable when you're seeing that? Do you want to go to Nick? Hey, Nick, how about let's run some LA series? <laughs> I, actually, I did that at the start. He started laughing at me. He said, okay, young, young fella, just listen and learn <laughs> while you're here. So, um, you know, it, it's great. He's very inventive. We come up with new plays all the time in our same structure. It's not like a new play, but uh, it, it's like a motion offense. We have a number of different calls. We can combine them and um, Nick's been great, giving me the freedom to be the offensive coach, which is kind of wow. bizarre when I was a defensive coach in in uh, in Perth and in the NBL. So uh, it's been great for me to learn a different system. And um, but again, you got the best players in the world. You know, you just put the ball in their hands. You got to create space and let them go to work. And um, you know, we've got some very talented guys. What have you learned um, working with Nick Nurse? It's just, it's unbelievable to me, just the schedule. That, that's that been the hardest thing that, you know, we play a game, we finish at 10.30, we jump on a plane, we don't get home to two o'clock in the morning, then you've got to wake up and do it again. And it's how you manage the players. You know, everyone goes up, has highs and lows, and how do you get that consistent balance? And um, Nick doesn't, uh, you know, lose a lot of focus. He focuses on the big things and, um, it gets that calmness around where the players can really relax and play their game. His name has been linked to the Lakers job. Do you think that he could be tempted by a role like that? Well, I have shorts ready to go if they, <laughs> if they need me there as well. <laughs> Just to get out of this cold weather. But uh, you look, he, he's got the runs on the board. I think he's been four or five years here, championship under his belt and and coached, uh, you know, exceeded expectations. And especially in this profession over here, there's a lot of pressure to win straight away. And, um, you know, we've been able to do that here. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, Nick's going to coach in the NBA for a long time. Trev, now that you've seen it up close and personal, you've seen the players, uh, going back to your time with the, with the Perth Wildcats and, uh, and, and other players here in the NBA, in particular someone like Bryce Cotton, are you? Do you feel now that you've seen it that Bryce Cotton is a player that could have played or should be playing in the NBA? Oh, 100%. Without a question. Without a question. No hesitate whatsoever. Then it's, you know, it's the timing aspect of being at the right place at the right time and getting the right fit on the team. Uh, I think Nick Kay can play in the mm. NBA without a question. Just his toughness and how he plays and how he plays against bigger players and the versatility that he has. And, there's a number of players that, you know, you, you've seen them come, the Mallow and Hampton and uh, Tate has been great for Houston. 
um, you know, it's not that far of a step away to play at the, the ultimate level. And speaking of the Wildcats, look, <laughs> they're not great right now, Kevin. <laughs> Have, has anyone called you yet? Has anyone <laughs> said, come on back home? <laughs> No, no. Look, I have uh, I have the faith in the players. They'll, they'll come good. They they've uh, been struck on the road for a long time. They've just got back home after a long period. So, uh, look, the cream usually rises to the top, and there's a lot of cream there. And I'm I expect uh, you know they'll do good things coming down the back end of the season. Well, I know that the uh, Red Army certainly hopes that is the case. I wanted to ask you, obviously, turning our focus to the 76ers, how do you stop Joel Embiid? It's the big question. Look, I've been very fortunate being this year that coming across some great players. He is unbelievable. Um, he's the MVP in my eyes. He can just destroy teams with his height, with his perimeter, with his passing. You know, we're going to have to give him multiple different looks. He's too good of a player just to play it one way. And uh, hopefully we've done a we've done a really good job in the past for, you know, maybe one or two of the game. So hopefully we can use that experience and uh, make sure we're giving him different looks out there. Mm, and you're going to have an advantage with our fellow Aussie, Matisse Thibel, uh, not... Mm. Uh, Apparently not available. You've just said, no, we're not going to let you into our country unless you get the, uh, the the jab. But, hey, Trev, talk us a little bit about also the relationships that you have with the players. We've seen with some of the teams, and particularly the one we focused here on this program has been the Lakers and what's happened to them and the relationship with the coaches. It seems like it's a, a lot different and you don't have that same level of authority. Would that be, would that be accurate? Yeah, without a question, as assistant coach, you... You're always, you know, you're the second, third or fourth hand man. It's, um, you know, that's probably been one of my adjustments really to get to know the players a little bit on a personal level and, um, you know, and build those relationships up because when the heat of the battle and you got maybe five seconds to communicate something that you see on the court and the mm. players are, you know, hot under the collar and they've been told three times and the referees <laughs> called a foul on them. If you don't have that relationship, it, it pr it quickly goes south. So um, that, that's been a big focus of mine while I've been over here, just building relationships with the players and the trust level and, um, you know, and it's been rewarding. Trevor, thank you so much for joining us on The Jump. We will let you go because we know you've got a very important yes. birthday day, a 12-year-old in your household now. <laughs> Yeah, so I got the family over visiting at the right time of the year for the playoffs. And then, yeah, my daughter Shay's birthday and just about to head out for dinner at the moment. Oh, well, oh, happy it. birthday to Shay. Thank you so much for joining us on The Jump. It was great to chat. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good Take on care. you, Trevor. Trevor Gleeson joining us there. Still plenty more to come on The Jump. Next up, Kane Pittman joins us with the latest on an NBA-bound NBL star. Time now to bring in our basketball insider from ESPN.com.au, Kane Pittman. Kane, welcome to you. Yes, thanks for having us. And uh, I'll see if I can follow up Gazy's Melbourne Comedy Festival routine from the start of the show. That was quality stuff. Did you like that, dude? Was it funny? Uh, I laughed, personally. I didn't laugh. Hey, I, I, I noticed that. <laughs> didn't see it coming. Uh, Usman Dieng and Hugo Besson, Besson. two oh. New Zealand breakers who have been attracting a lot of attention from the NBA scouts. Are they going to get drafted? Yeah, I think they will. And Usman Dieng is the one that is really at the top of the draft board. It's a projected first round pick. And people ask, he had a slow start to the season, and people ask, well, why is he so high on these draft boards? Well, first, first of all, it's the size. So he's 6'10", yeah. he's a prototypical NBA star uh, for the modern-day game, and he's still only 18. He doesn't turn 19 until May, and we have seen real progression through the season. He started off very slow, the shots come along, the production's been there, and I think a big part of it is that New Zealand didn't have the veterans in the team at the start of the season. They haven't been winning games, but I think he's been impressive. Mm. He has. He's not, he's not your explosive athlete, but he's a good athlete, yeah. and he's got that size and length, and he can shoot it. And when you look at the, the, the types of players the NBA are focusing on now, anyone that can stretch the floor, uh, and, and also I think once he physically develops, 
I think he's got the potential to be a bit of a rim protector too because he's got that instinct on, on the defensive end. So a lot of upside for him. The one that I'm surprised that, that people aren't quite as high on is Ariel Hawkeporty. Mm. I think he's made enormous strides this yeah, season agreed. with uh, Melbourne United. But for, for whatever reason, he's not spoke about a, as a first rounder as such. But uh, to me, he's that size, he's, he's, a, he's quick up and down the floor. He's another one that I think that, uh, uh, that they should be having a look at. Absolutely. He's big. I, I went to the game a couple of weeks ago and didn't realise how big he was. Mm. But he uses both hands, left hand, right hand. And like Drew said, he's been around veterans, Dean Vickerman, D-Max, coaching him. Uh, he's gotten a lot better. Interesting. Dean Vickerman, I uh, spoke to him during the week, and he actually said that internally they think Hook Porty is... They've got a bunch of good defensive mm. players. He thinks Hook Porty is right at the top of, mm. in terms of individual defensive talent. And he's only a teenager as well. Last night, a couple of great games in the NBL. The Kings, 13 wins in a row, if you don't mind, since Copes basically said they should sack the coach. Beat Illawarra in (laughs) overtime. This was a fantastic match, and DJ Vasilovic was on fire. Yeah, this was an absolute classic. I think this was the game of the season, just when you talk about the offensive firepower on each team. And I I don't know how you guys feel, but when you do look at the individual talent of guys that can get their own bucket in a variety of ways, I think these are the two most talented offensive teams in the league. I think the thing that stands out for Sydney, Jalen Adams goes out in overtime. He's cramping up. So, all right, we'll go to Ian Clark. He'll knock down a couple of threes. Jarrell Martin will get to the free throw line. DJ uh, Vasiljevic, who we know has come back from the Achilles, he dropped 30 plus. They're loaded. Well, they are, but I, I think that you look at Illawarra and, and it's a great game. Yeah. Great to see two teams uh, going at it, playoff-type atmosphere. But Illawarra has still got a lot of upside, particularly mm-hmm. on the offensive end. They're two imports. A- Antonio's Cleveland was 0 of 9 and uh, Xavier Rathen mays was uh, 3 of 13. So, you know, 3 of 22 from those guys that clearly there's, there's more offence that they can get. But Sydney... Uh, they are the form team and are the team right now to beat for the well, top. Speaking of Cleveland, though, Cleveland's not an offensive guy. He, he does score, but he's more of a defensive guy. And he didn't, he didn't play well at all. But again, when he starts to get going, mm. they're a better, much better team. Are we concerned about Perth? Because they went down last yes, night to the 36ers. We thought nine home games to finish, lock and loaded. I picked nine and oh two. You did. I look bad today. I'm sorry. I look, I look, I'm, I'm leaving. Could they miss? Well, they can. And this is the crazy thing. And we've kind of dismissed it because we've all just sort of believed that eventually they're going to figure this out with all these home games. But they've lost four or five at home now. And last night, Scott Morrison, after the game, described it as embarrassing. And he wasn't wrong because when you consider the stakes for this team going up against a team that's already eliminated from playoff contention... They weren't competitive. Kane, and what makes it worse is you look at the contrast. You you watch that game beforehand and you saw two elite teams uh, defensively, the way in which they were going about it looked really well organised. And then you watch the Perth Wildcats against a a team that's, that's, that's done for the season and they were poor. And Bryce Cotton is so important and he has a downer. And they look shockingly bad. Only had 70 points for the game. Uh, So they are a long, long way away from it. They need to turn around and turn around quick. Because like we're mentioning here, (laughs) given what we've seen, they they lose to Cairns and lose their last three, uh, which is not inconceivable. They're in all sorts of trouble. Or even if they drop one of them, then they've still got Phoenix and Illawarra. And, And let's just assume they win two out of the three. If the the Tassie run the table, then again, I know percentages are not in favour of Tasmania. They're a chance. They're they're still a chance, given the the poor form of Perth right now. Is that your big call? (laughs) I I don't think they will get. I think Perth will hang on. Just backs away. But they're only limping. If they they are going to limp into the line, into the playoffs. Uh, Kane. Awards season for the NBL nearly upon us. Defensive player of the year. I want to know from the three of you who you got. Yeah, well, Copes just mentioned Antonius Cleveland. And I think part of maybe the issue of the offensive stuff is that one second he's guarding Jalen Adams, next second he's guarding Xavier Cooks. He's so important for Illawarra. Uh, Who do you guys have? Uh, I mentioned that I spoke to Dean Vickerman and he said outside of Melbourne, of course he thinks the Melbourne United player will win uh, best (laughs) defensive player. But he said outside of Melbourne, he, no hesitation, Antonius Cleveland. There's Cleveland, there's Shea Illy, there's Cooks from Sydney. Cleveland just makes a massive difference with that team. When he's going, they're going. He doesn't need the ball to score. And he, he's, I think he's number one in steals yeah. In, yeah. The, in the NBL. So I'm, I'm Cleveland all the way. Yeah, Shea Illy's the one. It's, it's hard to think of a guy that comes off the bench. Mm. 
mm. is going to be your defensive player of the year. But it's such as, though, he, it, yeah. such as his impact, yeah. and 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 also the one we forget about a bit is Matthew Delavidova as yeah. well. And and if you look at the way in which Melbourne United have uh, the latter and, and their win loss, you know they've dominated the season. They've done it on the defensive end, and that combination they have in the backcourt, that relentless pressure they can put on. And, and another one again, another Melbourne United guy, Jack White. Yeah. I'm not sure he gets the recognition. He is an elite defender, can guard multiple people. So uh, Melbourne United, uh, the reason for their success I, is, I think, is what they get on the defense. Drew, we end. love you, but you're not. You don't know a lot about defense. Uh, it's I, hard for us <laughs> to believe that you know. You don't know a lot. Of, actually, you know nothing about defense. No, so I, just I know a lot close. about it, but he just, just didn't execute that. Yeah, on the sometimes you're, you're, you're physical. That's one each. One each. One That's each. it. No, that was a small one. Okay. Just okay, we're nearly tied up here. Before we let you go, Kane, I want to know just how Buck star Drew Holiday managed to make four hundred thousand in Australian dollars for playing eight seconds in a game. Well, people know the city of Milwaukee is close to my heart, but so is cash, and this is why this is my favourite. <laughs> this is why this is my favourite foul of all time. We see this Drew Holiday, eight seconds into the game, commits the foul, the teammates are up. They're giving him a round of applause. He had a, uh, a an incentive in his contract that he had to play at least 67 games and average at least 3.2 rebounds per game. He needed to play in the final game of the regular season to qualify for this, 306,000 US dollars. And the interesting part about this, the Bucks are in the luxury tax, which means that the owners actually had to fork out over a million dollars for this what? one foul. So that's how you look we're after your players. They, you know, they, they won the title. Again. Well, yeah, you we're know we're what? I think you've got to give credit to the Milwaukee Bucks as yeah. well. They, they could have gone through a situation and said, well, you know what? We've got the bigger picture here. We, nah. We, we, we've got a million bucks it's going to cost us. But uh, So, well done to the Bucks for what they, they did in allowing him to do that as well. Incredible. Kane, love your work. Thanks so much for joining us. Catch you next week. Catch all of Kane's fine work on ESPN.com.au. Still to come on The Jump, Hopes has a big call. Woo-hoo-hoo. You're watching The Jump Time now for the Bulk Nutrients Big Call. Coach, you are up this week. What have you got for me? Another big call. Yes. My big call is they wasted too much paper in this book trying to explain what? the Andrew Gaze what? way. What is There's it? only one way when you're playing with him. Oh Give God. him the ball and get out of the way. Right, the Andrew Gaze way. Look at all the paper. That, that is the foundation to, huh? for the youth. This is why basketball in this country is so... So strong because He's trying to tell people that's his way. The way it is, ago, give me the ball, coach. I got it. All the youngsters were picking up this book it, here. It's um, you'll get it in every. Does any, anyone read books anymore? No. Well, there's pictures. There's a lot of pictures. That's why. <laughs> that's why coach. It's illustrations. So you can see it all here. It's a fully illustrated type book. Look at the shorts on. Copes, do you want him to sign it for you? Mate, is that what, why you brought it in? Yeah, I brought it in. That is an elaborate. Time prank, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm not sure if you actually got him back. Is it one all no, now? I wouldn't have thought so. No, I think oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> I, th I'm coming. I think Gazy's just in front, just. <laughs> That's not, you're going to be in this storm oh. too. I'm coming at you Mate, too. Uh, come 20 on, up on. with 30 seconds to go. This right, one's right. in the book, baby. Okay, baby. Alright, that is it for The Jump this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. Stick around though, coming up on ESPN. It's New Zealand and Tassie, a Good Friday treat for you. Stay with us right here on ESPN. Have a great Easter.